Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to be with you here today. I am uh, Kayla. I'm joined up here by uh, Malia Salazar, who is uh, a new face to uh, our uh, teaching team on a Sunday morning, but she is not a new face to Stone. Uh, she is one of our service hosts, and so you'll see her up here going through announcements and stuff. Uh, she's our cafe director, so she runs, makes all the coffee possible. Is everybody grateful for that? In Jesus' name, amen. Um, and so she's probably served you coffee, and uh, she's also married to our creative arts director, Ben. And so it's really exciting to be able to tag team today. Yeah. Um, and uh, we are going, we're continuing on in our First Corinthians series, and we are arriving at a very familiar, probably the most familiar chapter in the book of First Corinthians. Anybody have a guess? It is First Corinthians... 13, yes, it yeah. is. Uh, some people are like, uh, teen. <laughs> uh, it's the love chapter, and uh, it's the chapter that talks to us. It's one of the most practical chapters in all of the Bible that inspires and challenges us on how to love one another. And this is a chapter that is famously used in a lot of weddings. It's like the wedding chapter. In fact, about nine months ago, I had the privilege of officiating Ben and Malia's wedding. And uh, I used this chapter. I talked through <laughs> 1 Corinthians 13. And uh, so we, one of the things that we were talking about as we were getting ready for this message on love is the reality that we will do crazy things for love, right? We're willing to do crazy things for the people that we love. Malia, tell us how yeah. you know that to yeah. be true. So uh, this is true, and I know that because, uh, as Kayla said, I'm married to Ben, who was up here just a few moments ago playing keys, and he has a bit of an unflattering story about the day we started dating. And uh, what happened was we were at a Denny's together with some friends, and we were all basically finished with our food. Our, our friend had only eaten like half of the burger he had, and um, Ben was already complaining about how full he was. And he's different now, mostly, but he would basically do anything you would dare him to do. So to impress the girl sitting across from him, who was telling him, don't do it, uh, he, of course, shoved the whole burger in his mouth when someone uh, dared him to eat the rest of it. And I don't know if you've ever seen someone eat that much food in one bite, but oh my gosh, it was so gross. Uh, it, was, it was not enjoyable to watch. I didn't really want to talk to him for a while. Um, and I mean, maybe it is impressive, but not exactly desirable. <laughs> um, but as I said, that was the night we started dating. So I later agreed to be his girlfriend and now I'm his wife. So maybe it wasn't an uh, unsuccessful tactic. I don't know. But it does go to show the crazy and and sometimes misguided things that we do for love. Even though it's an appropriate chapter for weddings and for how a spouse should love uh, their spouse, this is something that when Paul wrote was meant to be much broader than just the love between a husband and a wife. This was instruction on how Christians ought to love one another, both inside the church and outside the church. We're in that segment of chapters that was talking about gatherings and how we should handle just life with one another. And there's this passage that is reminding us how we should love one another. And there's a lot of different terms for the word love. There's a lot of different root words for the word love in the Bible. In the same way that love kind of carries a lot of different weight, uh, depending on how we use it in our culture, right? I love God. I love my husband. I love ice cream. I love coffee. You know, I love my dog. I mean, those are all true statements, but they all carry a different weight. And in the Bible, there are different root words for the word love. There's phileo love. There is uh, storge love. There is euros love, which is a sensual love. And then there is agape kind of love. And agape kind of love is the kind of love that is described when the Bible talks about God's love for us. It is a love that is selfless. It's a love that loves without condition. It is a love that gives without expecting anything else in return. And it's pretty convicting and compelling that that is the exact same kind of love that we are called to have for one another. It's an agape kind of love. It's not a storge familial kind of love. It is an unconditional, it is a deep, selfless kind of love that we are called to have for one another. And so this is, again, one of the most practical chapters that gives us just a roadmap on how do we do that. And so if you have your Bibles, you're taking notes, we're gonna dive in. First Corinthians chapter 13, uh, verse one through three. And uh, here we go, let's do it. 
If I speak in the tongues of men or angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all that I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardships that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing." Right, and so last Sunday in chapter 12, we looked at the different gifts that are given to Christians through the Holy Spirit. And we see that in that first verse, we, uh, when he, Paul says, and I speak in the tongues of men or angels, that's meant to encompass all use of speech, including uh, the gift of, of uh, tongues. And we also see him uh, say the gift of prophecy. And he's uh, mentioning these because in the Corinthian church, those gifts had become uh, status symbols instead of selfless ways to serve each other. Mm-hmm. And um, this, is, this was sowing disunity and discord within the church. And where chapter 12 was really focused on that false hierarchy of gifts, uh, chapter 13 looks at the heart behind using those gifts and living out a life of love. We've all heard what a clashing of cymbals or a resounding gong sounds like, right? It's in a band, it's like to make an accent, it's a statement, right? It kind of calls your attention. But we know that if somebody were to repeatedly clash cymbals together over and over again, it would stop being a statement, it would stop being an accent, it would quickly become frustrating, annoying, and give you a headache, right? And what Paul is saying when he uses that reference is he goes through this list of the makeup of a person that if all of these traits were true, would be a pretty incredible person, right? He says, if I could fathom all knowledge, if I could reveal all the mysteries of God, if I had enough faith that I could move mountains, right? If I gave all that I possessed to the poor, if I had the gift of prophecy, he says, if I gave my body over to hardship, which is speaking to religious persecution, if I did all of those things, if there was one person on earth that could do all of that, it'd be pretty radical, right? Like who could possess all of those gifts at one time? And if there was somebody who was walking on earth with all of those gifts, we probably wouldn't doubt their spiritual credibility, right? Yet what does this scripture say? It says, if you could do all of that, but your life was not led and lived in love, then it would be for nothing it would mean absolutely nothing. Yeah, that's true. And we see that the heart behind uh, giving of any kind of gift is important. I wonder if we can all think of a time that we have either given or received a gift that was not entirely freely given or not given out of love, whether it was out of obligation or strings attached. And I wonder if you can think of that time. It, you know, it's, it's kind of awkward, right? Yeah. <laughs> like the, the person who receives it can tell that like it wasn't freely given. And I wonder if we think of it uh, as we as Christians, uh, if we think of uh, it's fulfilling our duty to give of our time, of our money, our resources, to use our spiritual gifts. If we think of it as uh, just fulfilling our duty, we're not giving it out of a heart of love. That could really do more harm than good. The people who are receiving that gift, whatever it is, if they only see that, they may become bitter and jaded Mm -hmm. towards the church. And in uh, 1 John 4, 8, it says that God is love. And so there's no way that we as Christians can represent him without love. So what does it look like to live out a life of love? Uh, Paul says in the last verse of chapter 12, that, and yet I will show you the most excellent way. As a life, a life led in love was perfectly embodied in Jesus. And in the next four verses, uh, we see uh, some attributes that show that perfect love. So let's jump in uh, to verse four. If you're following along uh, in the Bibles, if you're taking notes, we're going to go briefly through each of them. It goes, uh, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. Mm-hmm. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. So the first thing we see there is love is patient. And in the Greek, that verb is specifically referring to having patience with people and not with circumstances. And I am so grateful for this because if I was up here trying to tell you how to deal with those situations where you're on the phone for 45 minutes listening to elevator music, waiting to speak to the next available representative, dude, I, I wouldn't know how to say that. I wouldn't know what to, what to tell you. I pull my hair out every time. But we're specifically talking about having patience with people. And we have the perfect example of God's patience with us in his forestallment of judgment and punishment in favor of redemption and salvation. Hmm. 
And we see the next one goes right along with it. It's love is kind. And in Romans 2, 4, it says, God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. So if we really focus on the kindness behind Jesus' sacrifice for us on the cross, that should compel us, that should inspire us to show that same kindness to others as we are called to love others. The next one is love does not envy and it does not boast. And one of the things we've seen as a common theme in the book of Corinthians is that they had this issue with pride. And it was causing a lot of division. And as Pastor David preached about last Sunday, when there, was, when there was the issue of gifts, of who had been given what gift, there was a lot of entitlement and a lot of hierarchy, like Malia just alluded to, that, man, my gift is more important than yours, and how God made me matters more than how he made you. And so they were using it to sow uh, division and discord, and there, it started to create a lot of envy in them. In fact, the Greek word for envy is the word physio, and it's only used seven times in the New Testament, and six of those are in the Corinthian letter. So we know that this is something that that they dealt with. This is something that we deal with today. What is envy? Man, envy is the act of being displeased at the success of others. Envy is being displeased at the success of others. Envy comes and starts to creep in when we move from admiring the gifts that God has placed in each other to resenting the gifts that God has placed in each other because we feel like it makes us better or worse than one another. In church, man, I wonder what our churches, what our communities, what our families would look like if instead of envying one another, if we would celebrate one another. If we would celebrate the gifts that God has placed in every single one of us, celebrate the fact that we're not all wired the same. But when we allow envy to come in, man, it it ruins what God is trying to do. It says love does not boast. What is boasting? Boasting is when we put our confidence in our own ability. When we believe that it is because of us that we're able to attain or achieve any good thing. We know that apart from God, we can't do that. And that goes right along with the next one, which is love is not proud. Church, we are called to be people of humility. We are called to be a witness to this world by the way that we live our lives in humility, not not with confidence in ourselves or our own. Oh, hi, buddy. How are you? How are you doing? Come here. Oh, this is my son, everybody. This is Rowan. Can you say hi? Yeah, you're going to help me preach today? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Where's dad? I don't know where he is. (laughs) Oh, he's in his office? Great. That's awesome. You want to go with Ashlyn? Or you want to stay up here? You can stay up here for a little bit. Uh, (laughs) You want to help me just hang out for a little bit? All right. Philippians 2.3 says, uh, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. And that's really the way we're called to live. Yeah, that's true. And uh, it kind of goes into this next one is love does not dishonor or love is not rude, which can mean that it does not act inappropriately, which uh, means we can take it as it doesn't offend people by disregarding social customs. And it's easy to see that rudeness causes problems while good manners can ease tension. First, uh, I'm sorry, Proverbs 15.1 says it as a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. And this one and the next one especially seem countercultural, as rudeness is quite commonplace in today's society. Mm -hmm. Um, I would like you to raise your hand real quick if you've ever worked a a job with customer service. Yeah, you know exactly what I'm talking about with this one, right? (laughs) Um, But one could try to argue that if we as Christians are called to be in the world and not of the world, why would it matter if we offend people based on worldly (laughs) social customs, right? Mm -hmm. But the important thing here is that that rudeness that we're talking about is disrespecting and dishonoring to others. And in previous chapters of 1 Corinthians, we see that Paul tells the church to consider the feelings of others in their actions. Uh, 1 Corinthians 8, 9 says it as, be careful, however, that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. So this doesn't mean that we need to um, concede to every worldly social custom and standard, but we can't maintain an attitude that shows disregard and contempt for others. And the next one we see here is love is not self-seeking or love is not selfish. 
And we see the very opposite of this in our, the world we live in today. And one particular way I've seen it is in self-care, or if you've ever heard the phrase, treat yourself. Mm-hmm. And um, it, it, I mean, it is important that we need to maintain our, our physical, mental, emotional health. And we often speak about um, serving from the overflow in ministry. But so often and so easily, self-care becomes self-indulgence. And really, that resembles the sin of gluttony more than it does the selfless love that we are called to as Christians. And uh, Paul made it clear in an earlier chapter that he had every right as an apostle to receive payment for his work to the church, but in interest of the gospel and in interest of showing God's love, he chose to never exercise that right. Um, And we see that there's no selfish purpose within God's purpose for us. And then, of course, we have the ultimate example of selfless love in Jesus' sacrifice for us on the cross. Mm -hmm. The next one is love is not easily angered. I have talked about many times, I think, in my messages about how um, I was born with a little bit of musical ability and then way less athletic ability. Um, I was not ever good at sports, but I played them because they were fun until I got to high school and I joined marching band, hung up all my jerseys, and it was like my life had began. Uh, and, And and I, I just have no coordination. I'm just really, really, really bad at it. And uh, when we started having kids, my husband is way better of an athlete than I ever was. When we had two boys, I was just kind of hoping that they were going to come out more like dad than they were like me. And uh, it turns out our first son uh, and our second one, they're a little bit more coordinated and they love sports. So I think they're going down dad's path, which is, you know, better probably. And uh, so Nicholas played his first season of basketball this year. And I was sitting with a group of parents right before his first basketball game, and they were kind of warning me and giving me a heads up on how basketball games for kids go and how like intense they are. They were like, there's a lot of like shouting and people are just kind of like tense and it's like frustrating, like, or, or, or you just get really excited and you just don't even know what comes over you. And the whole time I'm like, that is so ridiculous. Like, they're seven years old. Like, what are you shouting about? Like, I'm probably going to be on my phone the whole time. Like, it's just kind of whatever. They're just getting the hang of it. And then I went to my first kid's basketball game. And I lost my mind. <laughs> it was warm-ups. And Manny looks at me and says, am I going to have to sit somewhere else? Because, wow. Because I am like, go, Nicholas. And he was, it was, they were warming up. He made a basket when they were warming up. And I was shouting. There was like the slightest kid that was like blocking him. And I'm like, Raph, Raph, Raph. And everyone's looking at me. I just turned into a complete different human and realized that I, while I'm not athletic at all, I'm fiercely competitive and lost my voice at the first game and became very easily angered. And so I had to, I had to check myself after that first game. But, but here's what one of the things that I think is important to ask ourselves is, when we find ourselves in non-humorous actual situations that rise up anger in us, what is our first instinct and reaction? What is my first instinct when I get angry? Because here's one thing I want us to just know, church, is that all of these calls to love is not a call to be devoid of emotion. Okay, this does not mean love is never angry, right? Love is never all of these other things. And we have the ultimate example of that in Jesus. Jesus experienced every human emotion and he did it under the control and with the basis of love. In the book of John, when Jesus walks into the temple and they've made a flea market out of his father's house, he turned tables. He had righteous anger in that moment. Jesus was frustrated. He, he, was, he grieved. He wept. He was blunt and direct. He was kind and compassionate. He was angry. But all of it was done in and through the lens of love. And so as we experience emotions, I think a couple of things to ask ourselves if you're taking notes is this. Number one, do I control my emotions or do my emotions control me? I think that's a really important question to ask. We have to have control over our emotions and our feelings. We have to submit them under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, right? And the second thing to ask ourselves is, is everything that I say and everything I do done through the lens of love? Could I honestly say that I try with all of my heart to do everything and to say everything, even in my reactions through the lens of love? The next one is this, love keeps no record of wrongs. This one is hard, especially if you are a woman, because you have a lot better memory than most guys, right? (laughs) 
And we have this little index file in our brain where we keep everything, okay? Guys will forget. This is both yeah. of our experience. Yeah. And they'll be like, yeah, I remember one time you said that. And I'm like, when? And they're like, I have no idea, but you've said it. And I can say, well, I remember when you said that you were wearing these shoes, this shirt, this date, this time. We had just gone to this restaurant, right? Any other girls out there? <laughs> we just, we have it. It's ready. It's ready to dish out at a moment's notice. And what does the Bible say? It says, keep no record of wrongs. I'm so grateful that when I sin, Jesus is not keeping an index file of my wrongs, but the Bible says that I am forgiven and that the slate has been wiped clean. It says that he throws them to the bottom of the ocean. And in the same way, man, that we would be people who offer forgiveness, not a conditional forgiveness, man, but a forgiveness over and over and over again, not because people deserve it all the time, but because that's what Jesus has called us to do. Amen? Mm -hmm. And then I have one more. Oh, yeah. That's why you're looking at me. <laughs> yep, I know. Uh, love does not delight in evil, but it rejoices in the truth. And church, we want to just speak for a moment about the society and the culture that we're living in that's completely opposite to this statement. Because we live in a culture that celebrates sin. We live in a culture that doesn't just accept it, but promotes it embraces it, and it's embedded now in every single part of our society. It's seeping its way into the church, into our homes. And man, we are called as Christians to put a stake in the ground and say, there is a right, there is a wrong. There is black and white. There is truth, and it's found in the Bible. Man, we've got to reject this society, church, that says, go find your truth. Whatever, your, whatever it is that makes you happy, that's what you should do. Whatever you feel in the moment is your truth. And we've got to reject that and live completely opposite to that because there is only one truth and it's found in the word of God and it is the way that Jesus has called us to live. Mm -hmm. As we come to know him and we grow in him, man, we will know the truth. And what does the Bible say? And the truth will set us free. So we can rejoice in the truth yeah. and not take delight in evil. Right. Uh, this next one, we're on our last four. Uh, so starting in verse seven, we see love always protects. And that can also translate to mean endure or cover, mm -hmm. which can mean that loving sometimes looks like we're not trying to expose sin and shame in others. And this one, as well as the next three especially, can seem like foolishness if we are trying to follow these without ever considering the context of which we might be abused or taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. um, but we could also say, if love covers all wrongs, we could bring up a verse earlier in the series in uh, 1 Corinthians 5, where, where Paul instructs the church to remove a wicked person from their number. And the important distinction here is that it takes wisdom to know when protecting looks like welcoming someone back in to grow in the grace of God, and when it looks like removing someone who claims to be a Christian and continually chooses to sin as influencing others to do the same thing. And if we want to be like Jesus in his perfect love, what better way than to ask the Holy Spirit to prompt us and guide us, give us wisdom to deal with those situations? And the next one is love always trusts. And my favorite way of viewing this one is in giving the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. And showing Christ like love means that we are continually entrusting ourselves to the ones we are called to love. And we see Jesus entrust his life to Judas when Judas comes up to kiss him on the cheek to mark him as the one to be taken away and killed. Jesus knows Judas has betrayed him, but he is still willing to follow God's plan for his life, right? Mm -hmm. And again, luckily we have that prompting and wisdom of the Holy Spirit to guide us in those situations. So we might give the benefit of the doubt to those around us unless that uh, basis of trust is destroyed. And the next is love always hopes. And this can mean we don't give up on those who fail around us just as we wouldn't want them to give up on us as soon as we fail because we all fail, it's inevitable. And just imagine how impossible it would be to live as a Christian, to fill a room like this on a Sunday if God gave up on anyone who walked away from the faith, who gave up on them. And really, who are we to reject someone if uh, God has called them? And the next, oh, and the, the important thing to remember here is that that hope is not based on the Christian, but it is based on Christ and his redeeming love. Yeah. And here we, we've come to the last one from uh, verse 7. It's love always perseveres. And this one may seem, the, uh, the one way we see opposite of perseverance in our culture is in cutting out toxic people from your life. And I've, I've seen this commonplace even in the church. Um, but if we look at the life of Jesus, we see that those toxic people can be redeemed. Yeah. They can be called and used by God. 
and they may, may be seen as toxic, but they are still broken and hurting people in need of a loving Savior, just as each and every one of us is. And so if we look at all of these attributes in this list, we see that they are fully embodied in the life of Jesus Christ. And you can even, uh, even substitute the name of Jesus in place of love, and you have a perfect picture of a life loved in love. But we can also put our own names in place of love and just see how well we, we hold up to the example we're supposed to be uh, following. So I could say, Malia is patient. Malia always hopes. Malia keeps no record of wrongs. Oh man, that is not true. And it's humbling and it's kind of discouraging when we compare ourselves to the Christ that is in our, our title as Christians. But what this should do is compel us to seek after God and know the love that we are called to show to others. Yeah, as we were reading this, we thought, man, it can be really easy for us, honestly, church, to be crushed under the weight of this and just think like, I will never be all of those things. I, I can never master this list, so why do I even try? And it was an incredible example that came up a few weeks ago. Pastor Jeff was talking to a couple from our church, and they are a, a lovely, encouraging couple, uh, Dan and Mary, and they have a tree grafting business. They work in the orchard business, and they were explaining the process of what they do. And uh, there's going to be a video that comes up here in a moment, but uh, they were talking about how what they do to graft trees is that they take a branch from a tree, and inside that branch, there is something called cambium. And inside of that stump, there's cambium as well. And when they stick the branch into the stump, they have to cut away at the branch so that the cambium can be exposed and they stick it into the stump. And then there's something that's called callus tissue. And the callus tissue in the stump and the callus tissue in the branch they have to grow together and become one in order for this branch to start to grow. As they start to become one, they create an entirely new vascular system. They actually just become one tree. And in three years, those branches will become trees that are producing fruit. Church, as we look at this list, it is so easy for us to think, I can never do those things. How do I even start to do it? Can I encourage you with this way? Man, connect yourself to Jesus. As you root yourself in the word of God, as you make a commitment to follow Jesus, to be who he's called you to be, man, to live for holiness, to live for Christ-likeness, you will begin to grow with God as Jesus dwells inside of you, and you will begin to produce fruit. Your life will produce fruit. You will not recognize who you were and who you are once you start to follow in the way of Jesus. And it might not take days. It might not take months. It might take years. The reality is, is every single one of us is in process. Every single one of us is on a journey to produce fruit of Christ likeness in our lives. But it is possible. How? As we root ourselves in the word of God, as we connect ourselves to him, man, we will grow to produce fruit that will take on these characteristics. I want us to just read this last section, uh, which is verse eight through 12. And this is what it says. It says, love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it'll pass away. For we know in part, so we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. For now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. The spiritual gifts that are mentioned in verse 8 and 9, they can be viewed as tools to sustain our faith and hope while we wait for Jesus's return. What this passage is saying is that right now, church, we need prophecy. We need the gift of tongues to be able to communicate to God and to be able to communicate God's heart to his people. But when Jesus comes back for us and we're in the presence of God, we will no longer need these gifts because they will already be fulfilled. We will no longer need the gift of prophecy because what we see right now only in part, we will see in full when we are in his presence. The Bible says when we will be fully known by him, we will no longer need the gifts of prophecy and the gifts of tongues. These things, even faith and hope will pass away. And, you know, when the Bible talks about 
how he walked and talked and thought like a child. I was reminded of when my son was one years old, he was crawling around the kitchen and uh, I had the bottom oven drawer open because I was putting, I had pots and pans stored in there because did you know that that's something that keeps food warm? That bottom uh, shelf. Does anybody use it to put food in it? Yes, oh my gosh, you've read the instruction manual for the oven. <laughs> I have not. I use it for, pot. who uses it for pots and pans? Thank you, oh my gosh. Who uses the main part of the oven for pots and pans? Nobody, yes? Every Hispanic in here just raised their hand. <laughs> 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 no cabinet space, no problem, right? They're all inside the oven. But I, was, I, I had storage in that bottom compartment and I pulled it out and he, he got into the, sh into the cupboard and he reached his hand up into the oven when it was on and he grabbed the metal heating element and he was one years old and his entire hand blistered up and so he spent his first birthday uh, with a cast around his hand because he had burned it because Nicholas didn't know what hot was. He was a child. And after that, he learned that hot hurts, right? When Paul uses this description, man, when we were little, we thought like a child. We talked like a child. We acted like a child. But as we grow, as we mature, man, we start to know more. But every one of us will not be fully known or know fully until we are in the presence of God. Yeah, that's true. Um, Paul also uses the example of looking at a reflection in the mirror to represent our view of the world. And in the Corinthians day, mirrors were usually made out of polished metal. They're expensive, hard to come by. And so even if you had one that cost you a lot, you weren't gonna have a perfect reflection. It wasn't really comparable to the real thing. And it's just like if we wanna take a picture of like a beautiful sunset today, if we manage to get a picture without power lines obstructing the view, the colors aren't quite the same. So that photo can be a reminder to us of that beautiful thing that we saw with our own eyes, but it's never quite the same. And so what Paul is saying here is that, brothers and sisters, right now we are only seeing a glimpse of the love of God. You're seeing a blurred image, but one day we will know fully, we'll see face to face and it will be made clear, and it'll be like nothing we have ever seen before. But honestly, couldn't that be a little bit discouraging to know that we can't know everything, that it feels like there's a limit on our knowledge? And... Uh, one way to think of it is, it, as Kayla was talking about seeing and thinking as a child, when we were kids, we didn't know everything. Our parents were responsible for us. They, they were supposed to protect us uh, while we were free to live and grow and learn. And with a heavenly father that knows all, yeah, who has a plan for, for, for our good, we can trust him and we can be free to live and grow in his example. And we can just be content that we don't have to know everything but we yeah. can seek after God and know his character more. And this leads us to the last verse in, in chapter 13, which is verse 13. And it says, And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. And the main distinction we see between faith, hope, and love, and the reason love is set above the other two, is that faith and hope, as important as they are to our relationship to God as they are now, they will eventually be fulfilled. When we are in heaven, when we see Jesus face to face, we will no longer need to have faith uh, in things unseen. We will, and we will no longer need to have the hope that Jesus will return and free us from our sin because that will be a promise fulfilled. Yeah. But the constant will be love. And our, our need for love will never end just as God's love for us will never end. So if we look at the importance of love above these other things, what, what's the point of, of building our faith, or building our hope? Or what's the point of using these gifts if it's, it, it's hard to like, use the motive of love behind it? And the point is that we are called to love others. And when we exercise these gifts, when we seek after God, we know his character more, we know his love more, we can show that love to others just as we are called to do as Christians. And this is, this is so important for us because the, the love that the world had, has is so radically different from the perfect love that God has. Yeah. And we are called to show that to, the, to a broken world. Hmm. Church, we think about the redundancy of chapters that we know. And even as I was reading this, I thought, man, what possible like, new thing can we talk about? And the reality is, is that our, and our prayer and our hope is that every one of us would be convicted and compelled and challenged to be people who love this way. And I think about how our world would change and what the world needs to see 
is a bunch of Christians who can love radically the way that Jesus loved, who can be people who give gentle answers that turn away wrath, who can be people, man, that are compassionate and gracious. And you know what's such a beautiful thing is that even as I've just been in conversation and in company with all of you over the last couple of weeks, God has just brought certain situations where you have demonstrated that love. Church, our world needs us to accurately represent the love of God. Man, to speak the truth, but to do it in love. To be defenders of faith, but to do it in love. To show people that they have a purpose and God has a plan for their life because He loves them. I was, um, I didn't share this last service, but I just feel prompted in my heart. I was, um, with a family from our church a couple of days ago as they were celebrating the adoption of their daughter. And it was the most beautiful, one of the most beautiful things I've ever been a part of. It was the first time that I'd been a part of a, a being able to just sit in a courtroom where there's a child who's being adopted and, and being put in a forever home with mom and dad. And it was such a beautiful, beautiful moment of, of honestly of Christ-like love. And I walked out and in the middle of the courthouse, they had all these pieces of paper with cases, cases of different individuals of juveniles in our city. And I was just reading case after case after case and charge after charge. And my heart was broken because at the root of all of it, at the root of all of the brokenness is this desperate need for love is this desperate need not to know the love of just man or just a friend or just a hobby, but to know the love of God, to know why they were created, to know why we were put on this earth, to know that our life is not for nothing, that our life has value and it has meaning. When we understand the love that God has for us, we can understand his purpose in our lives and we can become a representation of his love to the world that so badly needs it. I'm gonna invite us to bow our heads this morning and I wanna encourage you, man, if you're here today and you have been looking for love and you've looked in all of the wrong places, I wanna encourage you with this truth that there is a God who sees you, who knows you, who loves you, who created you for a purpose, who has grace to forgive anything from your past to give you a new start. If you want a relationship with Jesus, I wanna invite you to pray this prayer with me. Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Jesus, I wanna enter into relationship with you. I wanna know the purpose that you have for me. Jesus, come fill the void in my life. Help me to follow you. Help me to love you as you love me. Jesus, I wanna spend eternity with you. And God, I pray for every person in this room, Lord, that you would convict us and compel us and challenge us to love the way that you love us. God, that as we are connected to you, God, as we make you our source, we will produce fruit in our lives. God, help us to be image bearers of you. Help us to be people who trust, who are patient, who are kind, people who are not easily angered, who keep no record of wrong. God, help us to live this out. Thank you for your word that changes our life. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Amen.